participants, my name is Diana Jimenez, and I'm the president of North Monterey County Lula. And if you've never heard of Lula, it's the Latino version of the NAACP. It's one of the oldest civil rights organizations that exists. And so I just wanted to give you a little bit of history in case you've never heard of Lula. So on behalf of the North County Lula and the North County Recreation and Park District, I'd like to thank you for being here with us tonight and welcome you again. Just a few announcements. There's water. Please help yourself to a bottle of water if you, if you would like one. Bathrooms are over here. Please remember to turn off your cell phones so they don't go off in the middle of very important response from our candidates. And um, you found your seats. Thank you for doing that. So the Office of the Sheriff is a very critical elected position in Monterey County. It provides protection and law enforcement in the unincorporated areas of Monterey County, which includes most of North Monterey, well, all of North Monterey County, uh, parts of Big Sur, Carmel Valley, South and South County, and I think the Veranda area as well. The sheriff has oversight and leadership over administration, enforcement, the coroner's office, and custody and operations and sets the priorities and tone for his department and staff. There are four candidates with us seeking to be the next Monterey County Sheriff, and all have accepted our invitation to be with us tonight. And I'm going to introduce them in alpha order. Delray Oak Police Chief Point, Jeffrey Point. Monterey County Captain Joe Moses. <laughs> Marina Police Chief Tina Nieto. <laughs> and Monterey County Justin Patterson. <laughs> we want the forum to be fair to the candidates and informative to the community. So each candidate will have an opportunity to provide a three minute introduction statement followed by nine questions, and with two minutes to respond to those questions, and ending with a two-minute closing statement. I will rotate who goes first based on alpha order. We have a timekeeper, Mr. Ramon Gomez, who will let you know when time's up. And say time. He will say time when time's up. And um, I think that's it. Any questions for me before we begin? So with that, we will start with the three-minute introduction statements. Oh, I did want to have one more thing to say. I will be referring to you as candidate Coyne, candidate Moses, candidate Nieto, and candidate Patterson. So we will start with the three-minute introduction with candidate Coyne. Thank you. Can you hear? Can you hear? Thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for having us all here and introducing us. Uh, I've learned in a campaign that there's always lots of rumors and lots of things said about what candidates think, what they believe, and having forums like this is absolutely critical to help you guys make the correct choice in who your next sheriff is going to be. My name is Jeff Moyne. I'm currently the Chief of Police and the Assistant City Manager at the City of Delray Oaks. I'm also the Chief of Police at the Monterey Regional Airport, where we provide contract police services for the airport district. I'm a 33-year law enforcement veteran. I am the youngest of three brothers, all three who have served over 25 years. Uh, I'm the youngest, they retired. I still have a ways to go, so I'm a little bit jealous about that. Uh, during my career, the last 16 years, I've uh, been in leadership positions in the agencies where I've worked, at either supervisory management or an executive level. Additionally, I spent about a year as the city manager in Delray Oaks when the previous city manager took another job. In the course of my career, I've had a wide variety of administrative, operation, and tactical assignments, whether it's managing training units, being a police chief, being a shift supervisor, a patrol officer, a canine officer SWAT. If you could do it in law enforcement, I've probably done it at least for five minutes or so. The reason I'm here tonight is I believe that as we get older, and as we get, come, get to the end of our careers, we should be trying to leave our legacy. And the legacy that I want to leave, and the reason I'm running for sheriff, and the lesson I want to teach my three children, who are teenagers and growing up, is 
we should always strive to take more and more responsibility to make things better for ourselves, for our families, and for our communities. And as I've risen through the ranks and I've worked in a couple of police departments as an executive, I have learned that I enjoy it, I'm good at it, and this is a perfect opportunity to take the next step to make things better for myself, my family, and my community. I think it's absolutely critical that you make the right choice for sheriff this upcoming election. Uh, if you see um, the, the turmoil in the news about things that are going on in the sheriff's office, and that's why this uh, election is very, very important. We need a change at the sheriff's office, and I'm hoping that before I'm uh, old and gone and put in the ground, that my kids will be able to see me make things better for my community and make things better for them and be a good example, and that's why I'm running. So thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to answering your questions, and let's go. Thank you. Next, candidate Moses. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Joe Moses. I've been with Monterey County Sheriff's Office for 27 years. I graduated from Sac State with a degree in criminal justice back in 1994, and I was hired by Monterey County Sheriff's that same year. With that experience, I've done everything you can think of in the Sheriff's Office. I've done patrol, corrections, investigations, internal affairs. I did a lot of special operations. Currently, I'm the captain in charge of corrections operations. I manage a $72 million budget, and I have about 320 employees that I'm responsible for. Having worked in all those parts of the department and understanding the Sheriff's Office, what I bring to the table, I have a deep understanding for the Sheriff's Office in every single part of this county. Through my time on patrol and special operations and with the search and rescue team for over 22 years, I've been to every single community here in Monterey County and I have a deep understanding for how diverse this county really is. What works for law enforcement in Pebble Beach may not necessarily work for law enforcement up here in Castroville or down in Santa Arta, and I understand that. And that's what, what it takes to be a good sheriff and be a sheriff for the entire community. So as I go through our campaign and, and if I'm elected, the main focus that the sheriff's office has to have is on the safety and security of our neighborhoods and our communities. So with that in mind, I have three priorities that I'm going to focus on. The first one is mental health. We need to take more meaningful action to address mental health in our communities. I think that's the basis of our substance abuse and our homelessness issues. We have an opportunity in Monterey County to build a behavioral health center that we'll probably talk about more tonight. I won't take up my three minutes talking about all that. But we do have an opportunity to take that meaningful action that's missing here in Monterey County to address mental health. The other one is collaboration and transparency. Working with all of these communities, working with our other government agencies to solve the problems that we're facing. The Sheriff's Office often takes these problems on, on ourselves and we don't reach out and, and ask for help when we try to address them. So building that relationship with the community, with our other uh, government agencies, including the Board of Supervisors, the only way we can do that is through trust. If you trust me and I trust you, we'll be able to move on down the road. Um, and that's through transparency, just being open with each other. My third one is efficiency of operations and taking a look at the Sheriff's Office and how we can distribute our workforce better. 35% of what the Sheriff's Office does is what you consider, uh, what you think of with the police department and traditional law enforcement. That other 65% is that other services we have to provide, such as the county jail, civil division, the coroner's division, all the IT databases for, uh, for the police agencies throughout Monterey County. I understand all that. I understand what it's going to take to be the next sheriff. And uh, looking forward to talking with you the rest of this evening and answering your questions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Candidate Nieto. So uh, I am standing up. I'm not sitting down. So I am the sheriff of the candidates. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Tina Nieto. And I'm running because we can do better. Um, if you recently read one of the newspapers, I got asked the question, what's the biggest challenge that law enforcement has? And I talked about trust and transparency. I was the only candidate that did talk about it as the biggest challenge. Our sheriff's office right now has a lot of issues. Recruitment, retention, budget, the morale is low. And, and I say that not just because it's a tagline. I say that because the Deputy Sheriff's Association has endorsed me. I'm an outsider. They, I was trying to, they tried to portray me as an outsider. So that's very telling. That's very telling that they didn't endorse people that they work for. Because they want to change. The communities want to change. I've been up and down this community talking to people about what's important to them. And people want safer communities. That includes in the jails. Our incarcerated population wants to be safe. We're not hearing about stuff that's going on in our jails. 
So, you know, the transparency issue, I'm a 33-year law enforcement professional. I spent the last 15 years as a law executive. In other words, I was running big things in policing. I'm also the president of your Monterey County Police Chiefs Association, which includes the sheriff who's a member of that. Um, and I'm not saying he's the sheriff, but the sheriff is at the point of that. And, you know, the other county chiefs are, the other chiefs are like, well, what's the sheriff's role in that? It seems like there's a lot of information or disconnect that's going on in our county. You know, I'm running to restore, you know, collaboration, working with communities about solving problems. My last 33 years in law enforcement has been a record of success after success. Why? Because I know I don't know everything. I know I have to work with communities to see what's important to them. And I know not all communities are the same, that they're a little bit different. They have different needs. Some are the same, some are different. In addition to that, I've run large budgets, I've run small budgets. I'm a military veteran. I've run, run large military units. I've run small military units with huge budget, budgets associated with that. I think it's the first time I've talked about that. I'm also your post commissioner for the state of California. People say, well, what's a post commissioner? I'm appointed by the governor. There's only five police chiefs or sheriffs that sit on this 18-person board that oversee policing for all of law enforcement. That includes police department, sheriff department, state policing. So I have a very, very deep understanding of what the issues are in policing right now, both in municipal police departments and in sheriff's departments, because I have to. Because we make policies, we make policies for the entire state that affect, affect over 80,000 law enforcement officers, to include deputies, that affect over 600 agencies to include the county sheriffs and affect the colleges. Right now, we're doing Thank you, Candidate Mitchell. Thank you. For my three minutes, I left my, my timer there. But remember, Tina Yana for sure. Candidate Tavani. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, I know all of us appreciate you being here and, and hearing us out. My name is Justin Patterson. I'm a 22 year veteran with Monterey County Sheriff's Department. My entire career has been with the Sheriff's Office. I've worked in every area and served in every area of this county. I know the Sheriff's Department, the ins and outs of the Sheriff's Department. I'm a constitutionalist. A lot of people keep asking, well, what's constitutionalist? I'm a guy that believes in each and every individual rights of each and every person in our county. I stand up for those rights. Your Sheriff's obligation is to stand up for those rights. I've been on your SWAT team. I served for you for 14 years on a SWAT team. I've been a canine handler. And most importantly, I'm a husband of a wonderful wife who's my best friend. And I have two adult daughters, one that just graduated from SU in Montana. Very proud of Our Sheriff's Department needs to be transparent and honest. I say that, I'm going to say it again. It needs to be transparent and honest. Honesty should be paramount in all your law enforcement across the board. And we need a sheriff that's willing to collaborate with all our agencies within this county. Because we all work for you. We're all public servants. And I think there's a lot of politicians that have lost that, that sight of they, they want to get that next step, that next step and make more money, more money, instead of being a servant to its people. That's what we need to get back to. We're supposed to be for the people, by the people. That's every politician across the board. And last I checked, I don't know too many California politicians that are for the people, by the people. We need to get back to that, to where we're public servants and we start getting involved more in our community. We need our neighbors to start reaching out and contact our neighbors. We need neighbors to know that they have trust and faith in the police. And that's what I would like to bring to the table the Sheriff's Office. Honesty, transparency, and someone willing to go out into each and every community and deal with the problems that are rising in every community. Every woman, like Joe said, is different. Cashville has different issues than Salinas. King City has different issues than Poplar. And we need to know how to go out there and work with each of the individuals in that community. And I'll tell you, if we get the community behind the Sheriff's Department, we'll all be better for it. And that means getting involved and having the community involved in the Sheriff's Department because it's your Sheriff's Department. It's not my Sheriff's Department. It's your Sheriff's Department. It's our Sheriff's Department together. And together, we can make our department and our county a better place as long as we work collaboratively together. My name is Justin Patterson. I'm running for your Sheriff, and I appreciate your vote. Thank you. We're going to begin the Q&A session and you have two minutes to respond to questions. <coughs>
We'll start with um, candidate posted. Question number one. What are the biggest issues you see within the sheriff's department? And if elected, what would you do to address them? Well, that's a very good question. It's a, a little, hopefully I don't trip there. A little, um, it's tough to pick out just one. There are many challenges that we do face, but I think the biggest one that we are facing is mental health. Trying to take a, a, that meaningful action, as I spoke about in my opening, to take a bite out of this, uh, this mental health crisis that we're dealing with. When we opened up the new jail expansion, we, we, we had, it's 564 beds. We were able to vacate a large portion of our old jail and that gives us that real estate to build a behavioral health center that we're missing so much in this county. Right now, if a deputy comes across somebody in a mental health crisis, they have basically three choices. They can tell them to move on down the road, which doesn't help anybody. They can take them to the hospital on a, on a 5150 hold, uh, unable to care for themselves whole. But the, the hospitals are under a lot of pressure to push those people back out, give them a dose of medication, push them back out so that they make room for a new one. We only have about 35 beds in this county. The third option is taken to jail, and jail is not a good therapeutic environment for anybody suffering from a mental health crisis. So we have this opportunity to build this behavioral health center to have that third or fourth area that we can take somebody, get them on medication that they really need, get them started on the counseling, so now they're ready to be transferred into our community and lead productive lives again. So I think it's, it's for the question, I think that's, a, that's really what's the basis. It's really been a drain on our resources, both on patrol uh, and in the jail. And if we can take a bite of that, a bite out of that, it's going to go a long way on making our community safe and secure again. Thank you. Candidate Nieto, same question. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question now? What are the biggest issues you see within the Sheriff's Department? And if elected, what would you do to address them? I'm going to get back to trust. It doesn't matter what kind of program you bring into the Sheriff's Department. If the community doesn't trust you, if the officers don't trust you, um, if the different special interests and, uh, you know, underrepresented groups don't trust you or if they don't have a voice, if the board of supervisors don't trust you, no matter what program you bring in, it's probably not going to do well. And I say that because I taught leadership for over, I've taught it for over 20 years in the state to law enforcement professionals. I help put together some of the leadership classes. And it's not just something that I talk about, but it's something that I practice. I've taken over struggling law enforcement agencies before, including my own, including my own, we're in a police department. It was struggling with recruitment, it was struggling with retention, it was struggling with some of the things that the community thought about the police department that may or may not have been true. And one of the things we had to get back to was that, that trust piece, that trust piece, really working on that trust foundation that the people trusted us again, that the officers trusted their leadership that the communities trusted that we would keep our word on things. So it really gets back to trust. And that also ties into transparency, about being transparent and being honest with your communities about when things go wrong, standing up in front of your communities as your sheriff, which I've done in the past for the, over the last 15 years running agencies. I've been a manager for 28 years, I think, if I look back, but 15 years as that leader. And I've gotten up in front of the community and said, you know what, we messed this up. But we're going to do better, we're going to do better with your guys' help. Tell us how to get better. But also basing it on my own experience to get better. So I think trust is the big one. And the other thing is that you have to have integrity. You have to have integrity. People need to believe that you're an honest person. And it's not built on just because you want better, you want the title, but you have to have that integrity. So thank you. Remember me when you go to vote for sheriff, Tina right. Nieto. Thank you. Patterson. One of the issues, or one of the things that I'm able to say is I actually work in your community right now. This is my community. Gosh, I love it. I've worked for many, many years. And the biggest issue I see, because I am boots on the ground, is the level of service that the Sheriff's Department currently is providing. Not just on patrol, but also in the jail. In the jail right now, we have about 100 hours of overtime being expended every day and we're running our deputies right here. On patrol, we are, we're only showing a minimum amount of deputies in North County is five. That's your minimum amount that we put on the streets. So we're not providing a level of service to the people of Monterey County that is needed, and desperately needed as soon as possible. We need more deputies on the streets because that level of service is what keeps our community safe. It's what keeps our deputies safe. 
And to do that, we need morale to change, too. Our morale at your sheriff's department is absolutely terrible. It's terrible in jail. They don't like the leadership. It's terrible in patrol. They don't like the leadership. That's what's going on in your sheriff's department right now, because I'm living it. I've been dealing with it, and I love this department. I love the people in this county. And we have to change how we think. We have to change how we do things. I'm not a reinventor of the wheel. I don't believe in reinventing the wheel because we have other counties that are doing better than us. Let's look to them, Santa Clara County being one of them, Santa Cruz County being one of them. More deputies are on the streets in those counties than we have because they have a system that works, because they have two, two divisions. They have correction officer divisions and they have patrol divisions. And that's something that's going to take work to change, but it needs to be done because we have to provide a level of service for our community that our community feels safe in. And our community needs to know that they're their own first responders. And we have to have faith in them and give them the tools and knowledge of how to protect themselves. And that's where, that's why I'm running for sheriff. That's why I believe that you need a constitutional sheriff in Monterey County that protects all our individual rights and all our individual freedoms. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I, I agree with all the problems that you've heard, but you're electing a sheriff who's the chief executive officer of your sheriff's office. So let's look bigger, right? What causes these? These are symptoms. The biggest problem is I believe the sheriff's office has lost its focus. And what is that focus? It's communities like Castro, Chula, Big Sur, even Pebble Beach. The focus should be on the communities and the people there. And what I mean by the sheriff has lost its focus, it's $130 million that the communities make in the sheriff's office. Do you have a sheriff who has the ability to turn the sheriff's office around? I have a history of turning struggling agencies around, struggling units around, making things better wherever I go. And I think the number one thing we need to do to regain our focus is create a vision. What kind of sheriff's office, working with the community, working with deputies, working with command staff, what kind of sheriff's office do we want? Then we have to put together a, st a strategic plan, a comprehensive one, for all the divisions. 12 identifiable, 10 identifiable objectives for each division that your chiefs will carry out and will be held accountable to do. Um, so once you get a vision, you have to create a plan, a business, a, a private business with a $130 million budget without a business plan is bound to fail. So that's what I think the biggest problem is. Then you can start having your command staff address mental health. Then you can develop a leadership program for all of your deputies and staff to address transparency and trust. And then you can go through your budget, line item by line item, tailor that budget to your strategic plan so that we can get more deputies out on the street and in the community. So think about that. Sheriff's office needs to be refocused and you need an executive to come in there. Think more like a business, but one that's not focused on customers focused on communities. Thank you. Going on to question number two, and we will start with uh, candidate Yanko. The question is, why do you believe you are the most qualified to be the next Monterey County Sheriff? So I encourage people to go to my website and just see all the things that I've done in law enforcement. I've dedicated my entire adult life, and I mean my entire adult life, to service to others. That's in policing, that is a, as a military veteran, getting out as a captain. So service is at my heart. And people ask, well, why is service at your heart? So I'm, I'm going to share why this is important to me, why I think that um, I would make the best sheriff um, if elected. So I came from a, a, a large Hispanic family. We were a poor family. I have felt uh, the pain of you know, racial profiling and being targeted because of the way my family looks. And I say that because where I grew up, my father was a bartender, and we were only the second Hispanic family to move to the neighborhood. And my father would get stopped every night by the police until they got to know who they were. And as a child, he would come, or as a child, my dad would come home and he'd share those stories. And, and it, it wounded me a little bit. It wounded me. But policing has also been very good to me. Policing, I love people that go into public service. I think it's the greatest calling anybody can be in. And that's one of the reasons I'm running for your next sheriff, because I believe the deputies and professional staff deserve more than what they're getting. And all those things that you know my opponents talk about, all the great plans, I truly believe it gets down to the foundation of trust. Trust is not a symptom. Trust is something that you have to build, and all the other things are the 
plans that are built onto trust. I don't say that, you can Google it. Most of the people that talk about these things agree. But policing's been good to me. My grandfather actually fixed police radios and was very proud when I uh, became a police officer and being from ear to ear. And it made me feel really good. But it's also that that makes me very multi-layered to understand that people have stories, families are good, members do bad things, but families are good. So I want to bring back that sense of fairness to some of these communities, and that's why I'm running for sheriff. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Patterson. I believe I'm the best candidate for a few, a few reasons. Number one, I've gone and I've looked at our past command staff, and I've focused on getting in and talking with them. Under Sheriff Galen Bonner, Chief Deputy Tracy Brown. They're very well known in our community. They're very well known as trust. They have great leadership, and they're honest and full of care. Both these men have backed me. My own father-in-law, Fred Garcia, also a man of trust and transparency. He worked for you for 28 years. Galen Bonner did over 30 years in law enforcement. Tracy Brown, nearly 30 years in law enforcement. All three of these men have said they will come back and help with a transition team to get us back in the direction that's needed for the people. These men are valued people in our community that have already proven. And with that, that will build the morale in the Sheriff's Department. It will bring deputies to our department that want to work for us. Because ultimately, we need to have people that want to work for us. Right now, we don't have that. We have 14 people put their name on the list to come out to patrol from the jail. There's over 200 deputies in that jail. Why do they not want to come out? That's a question that we have to start asking ourselves. It's because our command staff has just lost focus. They are not for the deputies, they haven't been for the people. We need a command staff that can work with not only the deputies, but the people. And that's the command staff that I will have in the Sheriff's Department, because I will be transparent with the community. I'll go out into the community, and I'll see what the community needs are. That's why I believe I'm the best candidate for Sheriff. I've worked for you in your entire community, and I love the people in my community. That's from Parkfield to Pavaro to Aromas down to Big Sur. I have met more good people than bad people. And that's what the Sheriff's Department really needs to start focus on. The good people that will help us be a better department. Yes, we need to move out law and order as well. And we need to go after the people that are breaking the law and terrorizing the community. Thank you. Candidate Hoyt, any questions? I think I'm an excellent but I'm hoping you decide I'm the best candidate for sheriff. My professional resume, my leadership, the things I've done professionally, you can look on my website, jeffwin.com. I've led agencies, I've led units, I have led teams, and I've built trust, not only within the organization, but within the communities that I serve. Delray Oaks had a rough reputation uh, with trust, uh, with their police department, with surrounding cities and, and, and citizens basically from all over the county in the last several years, we've built up a level of trust from our community. So I'm not going to say I'm the best. That's up for the community and the residents and, and, and the citizens of Monterey County to decide. But I do say that I am an excellent candidate. I have an uh, MPA in organizational management. I have a BA in Homeland Security. I've run two different police agencies. I've done the only complex police consolidation with two agencies that not only in, increased the service and the, was able to attract and hire better, more professional staff so that the community can trust these better officers, but we did it for less money. We did it 15 to 18 percent less than either jurisdiction was paying before. So whether it's my background, my education, my training, my record turning around agencies, and taking plans and building more trust. Uh, I hope you think I'm an excellent candidate, but I urge you, I want to earn this. I don't want to just have one or two answers and have you go, oh, he says he's the best candidate. Check out my resume, check out the things I've done. I want to earn your vote and I want to earn this position. Thank you. Same question, candidate Moses. So why am I the best candidate? It comes down to commitment, it comes down to experience, it comes down to vision. For commitment, I'm committed to Monterey County. I've lived here for the last 27 years. 
I grew up in Sacramento, but this is now my home. I've spent most of my adult life here. I've raised my children here, um, and we are planning on being here for the rest of our lives. So I am committed to this county. I have a vested interest in who our sheriff is. And when I was discussing this with my wife, before we went on this endeavor, she said, Joe, you're going to make a good sheriff. I think you should run. So that's important. That's why I'm running. It's also about experience. I understand the sheriff's office. I am the only candidate that, candidate that has worked through all levels of the sheriff's office up to captain. I understand what it takes to make changes, and I also understand what hurdles we have to overcome. I can step into that office tomorrow and be able to take over and continue running uh, and making the changes and making the sheriff's office a better place. The other one is vision. Having a vision for the sheriff's office. I've talked a little bit about mental health. I have that vision. We can talk about recruitment. I have ideas on how we can recruit our new people. That is really what the issue is with, the, with our staffing levels, is recruiting new people to the sheriff's office. We can't recruit like we did 20 years ago. We have to recruit for today's generation. And that's a different way of doing it. Let's hire somebody, somebody that has a degree in marketing, 25, 30 years old, understands our new generation, understands how to market our business. Because I love this profession, and I wouldn't change a thing. Going to, if I were to do it all over again, I would stay in this profession, and I want I want that message to get out to our young people, so that they have an interest in being deputy sheriffs of Monterey County. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to question number three, and we will start with candidate Patterson. The question is, what does community policing mean to you, and how have you, or would you, put it into practice? Well, I've already kind of talked about this a little bit. Community policing is all about us being involved in the community to begin with. And it's not just being a figurehead sitting in an office in the corner office of the sheriff's office. I'm not a good office guy. I don't like to sit in the office all day long. I like to get out. So community policing means not just your sheriff, but his executive management team, as well as the deputies, getting out in the community and getting to know the community. I've been doing this for the last 22 years. In my I've gotten to know a lot of great people, a lot of good business owners. A lot of them support me because I believe in our community. To address it in a way as under a Patterson administration, which is for the people, we have to start looking at different avenues. And those avenues I believe we need to have town hall meetings similar to something like this in every community. Allow the community to come have their voice and tell the Sheriff's Department the, the problems that they have existing in their community and what they want us to do about it. And we can in turn tell them what Law and order is all about that we can focus on that particular issue if we're able to handle it or if we can work with, it, with them to you know, fix the issue at hand. We have an issue that's imploding right under our eyes. That's the homeless. The homeless is skyrocketing in this county. It's because of a, a lack of law enforcement. It's because of a lack of law and order. And we have to figure out how to address that. And that's being involved in the community, sitting around the table with our community addressing it in a constructive manner that we can all agree on. Not everybody's going to agree with our, our thoughts, but if we get a majority of the table to sit down and go, we need to focus on it and fix the community in this manner, we can work together and make our community a safer community for our children, for ourselves, and everybody around us. And that will make Monterey County a much better place to live. We already live in one of the most beautiful counties in the world. I think we all agree. We're right down the street from the coast. And we're fortunate to have that. We need a sheriff's department that instills trust in, in the community and truck that we need to come to the table and say, we're here for you, and vice versa. Thank you. Candidate Point, same question. Community policing comes down to communication. There's two words there, community and policing. Uh, policing is the other part of it. And the communication part is, what do you want from your law enforcement agency? What do you want from your sheriff's office? What do you want from your police department? So it's communicating, which the most important part on our end should be listening, because there are many unique small communities in Monterey County. And what a good sheriff and what an experienced sheriff should be able to do is bring that small town policing to each of those communities. So speaking with communities, listening to what they want, but then also being honest and telling you what we can provide. Well, we'd like 10 more cops on the street here in Cashville. I'm going to be honest with you as the sheriff and say, I can't provide that right now. But I'm going to try and improve service and staffing levels. So how would I implement it? That's the second part of that question. It's not only what community policing is. Listening to the community, telling them what we can provide, 
making policing better, right? making public safety better in the community. First and foremost, how do we start communicating? Each community, Castleville, should have a member of the command staff as a liaison and representative to the community so that business leaders, community leaders, faith-based organizations know who they can go directly to and talk to to get information to the sheriff's office. Then we should start having a formal community policing plan, having deputies go out and visit businesses, what's going on in the neighborhoods, having deputies stop in at parks, right, when kids are playing football or soccer or basketball, informing that and making deputies work with their supervisors to report their outreach into the community. So it's communication, it's listening to what you want, it's being honest what we can provide, and then making sure that we're doing it at all levels of the organization, reaching out to each community, because they're all different. Thank you. Candidate Moses, same question. Well, what it means to me that community policing is like we talked about, that's my second uh, uh, priority, is that collaboration, that transparency, reaching out to the community, building advisory, community advisory boards, not just for the whole county, but as we talked about up here, each individual community should have an advisory board that advises the sheriff on what is important to them and what issues they're dealing with so that we can address them. But I'll give you an example of uh, community policing to me. So as, as a commander, and I, I have a, a master's degree in emergency services administration, I have an expertise in disaster response. So I've been an incident commander on most of our large fires and our floods over the last uh, probably 15 years. When we had the Pfeiffer fire down in Big Sur, and a bunch of uh, houses burned, and we ended up having to close the road, and people didn't know if their house had burned or it had not burned yet, um, and I was the incident commander. The community was reaching out and saying, we need to get in there, we need to know if our houses have burned or not. The fire department was there from Cal Fire, which comes from the state level. They were there saying, nah, it's got to be closed, we're still, we've got equipment in there and everything else. Well, I was able to work with our community organization, CERT, the uh, um, Community Emergency Response Team that is in Big Sur. And I appointed them, I said, okay, you guys identify who we can take up there to go look at their houses. We developed them, uh, caravans to take them up there and look at their houses. So that's what, that's community to me, getting the community involved, understand what your needs are, even though we're looking at it from a totally different direction. But you, as a community, reaching out to you and saying, what, what does that mean to you? What, do you? what are your needs? In that particular instance, that was the need. We need to see if our houses are still standing. I, I made sure that that was accommodated and we got that job done. So that's what, that's what community policing means to me. That's what community outreach means to me. And that's what we'll expand on as your show. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Nieto, thanks question. does and you know I've taken over struggling agencies that didn't understand what community policing is and it's something that the leadership really has to reinforce um, with the officers with the deputies with the professional staff if you really want to make change in the culture and the organization work with your communities it includes all the things that some of my opponents have talked about it includes active listening on the part of the leader to find out what is going on in these communities. Because like I stated earlier, some things are unique to communities, others are you know, different. And so you have to go on it. I've also, so my success is I've always gone on active listening tours um, every time I take over an area to find really deep dive into what's going on there. And then you start putting your plan into action, whatever that plan is, talking, collaborating. In fact, I talk about that a lot in a lot of my literature. And if you go online and you look at the other things that I've talked about, it really is about collaboration and communication. Because if you don't communicate, which includes the active listening piece, which includes making sure that they understand what you're saying, if you don't collaborate with your communities, you're going to fail. And you have to be honest with them. You have to use the, you know, talk to them like the, lang the right lingo. Like the fire that one of my friends talked about. Um, I didn't know that, that that person was the incident commander. I'd always thought that person was a branch manager. Because usually it's the sheriff that's the incident commander. How do I know that? I've run large incidents in the city of Los Angeles, and I've been part of that leadership team. Sometimes as the incident commander, sometimes it's just like the logistics chief or planning chief. I do have a very strong background. I'm TEAKS trained. I'm considered an expert up and down the state in incident command. 
That's why I've been called on to go to D.C. for different things. Why the state has asked me to sit on different boards. Why I'm your post commander. I have a deep understanding of that. But community policing is really, truly working with your communities. Thank you. We'll move on to question number four, and we're going to start with uh, candidate point. The question is, what success have you had implementing and sustaining programs to effectively respond to individuals experiencing a mental health crisis? So every police department, okay, it's on, sorry. So every police department, is, this is a priority across the nation, is implementing a program. So, Delray Oaks, we're a small police department, but we still have the same priorities that larger police departments have. I've come from much larger agencies, and you have to do it differently. But the basis is training. So, you can have programs, you can have plans, you can have teams if you have those resources. But if you don't have enough staff to do that, and like I said, and like my opponents have said, there's not a lot of resources in control. So when you have small resources, you have to rely on training so that each individual deputy is trained, each individual police officer. So what we have in our police department, we put together is a formal training program, and it is filled with things like critical uh, incident training, uh, uh, mental health first aid, and we have a, uh, we keep track and we hold our staff accountable for attending these things on a yearly report on what training we send them. So making sure that your officers have those uh, training resources too, collaborating with county mental health and other agencies, other police departments, and your first aid providers. Uh, third is uh, another portion of that training, it's not necessarily mental health training, it's de, uh, de escalation training. So you have to have a holistic vision of what you're trying to do because if you go to a dangerous situation, it's not just knowing what you need to say and the words you need to say, it's knowing how to de escalate things so that you don't have to use force. Right? And then another part of that training is using force appropriately. What we've done is we've also implemented a less lethal and de-escalation program with a simulator where our officers, several times a year, have to go through de-escalation scenarios. Now health training, de-escalation, and working with your partners. Thank you, candidate Moses and Um, you know, working in the jail, I have the opportunity to work with a lot of people that are in a mental health this, uh, crisis. And programs that we build, um, we have a multidisciplinary train, uh, team that we've built that includes the, our mental health uh, practitioners in the jail, it includes the Intimidad Medical Center and their groups, it includes behavioral health, the county behavioral health, and we have weekly meetings. And those meetings are about discussing the individual cases. We have individual cases and individual people that are incarcerated in our jail. And we meet and talk about them. How are they doing on the medication? Where are they out with their counseling? Hey, they're gonna be, we're getting ready to release them. Do we have a place for them to go when they get out? Are, are they, do we have them connected to services with the, um, the Tividad? Or do we have them connected to services with um, public health? That's been going on since I've been uh, captain of the jail for the last two years. And it's become more and more robust. We started including more and more people. And we're also getting better at providing those services, which is so important. And that's where we're taking that, I can talk about taking that step. Now I'm ready to build that behavioral health center and using this MBT team to identify those people that, that can go into this program. We've also started a medication assisted tra uh, treatment program inside the jail to help those that are fighting substance abuse and get them on medication and counseling so that while they're in custody and sober, we can get them started on a program. Then when they're released into the public, we can connect them with the services uh, in community-based organizations. So that's what, uh, that's, that's the program. MBT is the program that I uh, implemented and that we, we sustain today. Thank you. Thank you. Gosh, this is such an important question um, because we're under the Hernandez settlement still, and it had to do with you know the medical care and taking care of our incarcerated population. And this settlement was it happened in 2013 for those who don't know. And in 2015, the county said, "Hey, we're going to do these things best practices, um, so we can take care of our inmate population, including the ones that are dealing with men mental health issues." And it's uh, 2022, and uh, we're still under the Hernandez settlement. We're spending millions of dollars as taxpayers. 
uh, not meeting the best practices for this, this mandate. Uh, in addition to that, it takes a human toll. Uh, I'm appreciative that, that they have this collaborative mental health approach, which is pretty standard, actually, in policing. It, it's not any new ideas. This is pretty standard. Most officers are, are see what they call CIT trained. So this is something that, you know, as a post commissioner, I helped put together those programs. So, so this has been around for a while. So I'm really glad when I hear that there, those things are happening. I, I actually already knew that, obviously, ready for the sheriffs. But we still have failures. We have failures that take human tolls. Just about three or four weeks ago, we had an inmate with mental illness issues who committed suicide in the jail. Who heard about that? Because that was a lack of transparency with your sheriff's office. Your sheriff's office should be looking at these things and say, where did we fail? And they should be talking to the community about it. Look, we failed. And we, we can do better. You know, this is very tragic, not just to the community, but to the families. Yeah, the person was in jail, but they're a human being. And we need to do better for everybody. And we're not doing that great. And that's why I'm running for sheriff. But then again, looking at my professional background, I actually know how to put together programs and how to measure things so we can get better. How to measure things when we're not doing it so well. So we're saying, okay, that's not working real well. Let's pivot. I too sit on many committees throughout the community. Right. Thank you. <coughs> Candidate Patterson, any questions? Right now, uh, every patrol deputy for Monterey County is CIT trained. It's not enough. It's a week-long training that they get towards the, the beginning of their career on patrol. Mental health is a huge issue in our county. It has a lot to do with our homelessness. A lot of people are, are, that are homeless have mental health issues. Some of that is drug-induced. There has to be a way that we have to help the community fix that problem. Are we going to fix it 100%? No, it's no way. I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm not going to be able to fix the mental health problem on our county. But what I can tell you is that our deputies need more training. Our administrators need more training on how to properly deal with the mental health problem that we have today. June 1st of last year, I encountered a subject that was having a mental health breakdown. As soon as I contacted that subject, it ended up in a fight. I'm proud to say that both of us came out fairly unscathed, you know, but it's an issue because you only have one deputy going to calls most of the time because there's not enough deputies on the streets. Our current administration has completely lost sight of what's important to our community by providing more deputies on the street and providing more training to deal with mental health, not just out on the street, but also in the jail. We have subjects that are suffering from mental health on a daily basis, and we need deputies that are compassionate and patient. Patience is huge when it comes to dealing with mental health. We currently have a mental health crisis that comes out and helps us in the community with your deputies. They show up to calls when we're dealing with a 5150 person that's being taken on a 5150. They'll show up to a call if the person does not meet those standards, so they'll have a plan for that individual. Unfortunately, they are only allowed to help us only so many hours out of the, out of the week. We get them four days out of the week, and that's it. So does that really truly serve our community? It's not. They need to be available to us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, like other counties in our, in our state. And we can utilize that help. Thank you. Sorry. We're moving on to question number five, and we will start with candidate Moses. The question is, the current sheriff's administration has been riddled with controversy that includes Board of Supervisor censorship, lawsuits, ongoing investigations, in-custody deaths, and a lack of transparency, trust, and accountability. If elected, what specific actions would you take to change this narrative? Well, it really comes down to, uh, to having a conversation. Um, we talk about transparency, being open and honest, and I'm going to be open and honest with you as sheriff. Sometimes I'm not going to be able to tell you everything, but I'll be able to say, I can't say that, and here's why. But whenever we have an answer or whenever I'm able to talk, because we talk about active litigation and things like that, then I will be able to come back to you and talk to you about it. Um, I'm going to share a story about how I will change, or I, and I have started to change, that narrative. The Board of Supervisors uh, voted to look at doing a Sheriff's Oversight Committee. And I'm not opposed to a Sheriff's Oversight Committee. I'm all for an Oversight Committee of all of our government agencies. But let's take a look at how much 
oversight the sheriff already has. So I sat down with each individual board of supervisor member separately, and I asked them, the first question I asked, what's the goal of this oversight? When they didn't have an answer, I said, well, let's look. Here's what we do. This is the nine different spots where we have oversight already. Let's look and see if another oversight committee is the right way to do it. So I share that story with you because that's the kind of relationship I'm going to have with not just the board of supervisors, our other police agencies, our other fire departments, our other county government, the, uh, our community. What the, the result of that was the board of supervisors then met the following Tuesday in closed session and they voted to put off starting a sheriff's oversight committee so they could put, do more study and look and see if the, to reach their goals if we already have what we need in place. And so that's what I bring. That's what I bring is having that communication, having those hard conversations, and being willing to have those and being open and honest about what we realistically can do and what what is the best direction going forward. So thank you. Thank you, candidate Mantles. Any questions? Well, it starts with well, it starts with honesty and integrity. Um, you know, one of the fun stuff here is involved in many of those lawsuits. And you don't have to wait 27 years to start doing the right thing. I spent the last 33 years of my career doing the right thing. In the military, the eight to 10 years that I did with them, I did the right thing. Because that's who I am as, as Tina Nieto. I do the right thing. And it hurts sometimes. It's hard to do the right thing. It's hard to be honest sometimes. It's hard to say, I gotta stand up for that value. Because you have competing values out there. Here's what I'm going to do that's going to be a little bit different. I'm going to be honest with the public. I'm going to be transparent with the public. I'm not just saying that. I already am. I've been doing these things. This is not something where I say, well, when I'm going to be the sheriff, I'm going to, I'm going to do better with this. This is something for the last 33 years in law enforcement I've done. This is something for the last 15 years as a law executive running organizations. This is what I do. You can, you can Google me. You can go to my website. And you can see, wow, she really does those things. The DSA, that's why they endorsed me. They said, wow, Chief, you actually do the things that you told us that you did. You, you did it here, here, here. That's one of the things I'm going to do. As far as conversations with the Board of Supervisors, it was actually one of your Board of Supervisor members who asked me to run. Told me, there's a lot of issues, Tina. You have a reputation of doing the right thing, having that conversation, you know, agreeing to disagree, when, when, but we know where you're coming from. The people that have endorsed me, we're on opposite ends of the spectrum sometimes on the things that we, we uh, like how we see the world. Because I'm very law and order. I believe in safe communities, but I know there's different paths to get there. And they said, you know, despite that, I'm endorsing you. Because here's what I know about you, Tina. You sit down and you have the conversation. And you look at the alternatives and you say, how can we make this better? How can we involve the community? This is something that I've been doing. Thank you. Candidate Patterson, same question. Honesty and transparency are very key. They're paramount in your sheriff. They really are. The question was asked about many lawsuits we have going on that you and county, the people of the county are not from the county. And one of our candidates made some false allegations, and there's a 16-page three-judge ruling that came out and said that that candidate defamed with malice several times several times. You have three other candidates that are known for their honesty and integrity. Three other candidates that have put their life on the line and been honest and in full of integrity for you already, that serve you in the public. We need a sheriff that's going to step in day one with honesty and integrity and lead with, with your deputies, not ahead of your deputies, with your deputies. Your sheriff's department is only as good as your weakest 14 years that I served on that SWAT team, I have almost the entire SWAT team behind me, backing me, pushing me. They're the guys that came to me and said, you gotta run. Because we need somebody that we can trust. We need somebody to collaborate with our department. We need somebody that is willing to come to the community and talk to the community and say, this is the issue that we have at hand in our sheriff's department, this is how we need to fix it. Can you help me? I'll march the community right under the Board of Supervisors, and we'll get what's needed to protect our community. That's what we need. And that's what will stop all these lawsuits. We're never going to stop all of them, but we can sure as heck minimize them. And that's by putting the right person in the corner office of the sheriff's office, voting for that right person. And you have to ask yourself, 
how much more are we supposed to take with our sheriff's department? How much more money comes out of your pocket to pay for that lack of honesty and lack of integrity? I don't think we should have to pay one more dime for lack of honesty and integrity. We should all be able to stand up in front of all of you here and say, I'm going to do what Thank I'm going to get. Thank you. Your sheriff and his command staff need to be the example of ethical, honesty, and transparent leadership, not believe that they're the exception to it. And if you've read the headlines and watched the news, it's not happening. So the question is, what would you do? Well, first and foremost, I totally agree with working with the supervisors if they want to do an oversight committee, but it has to be done correctly. What are we trying to accomplish? We have to work within things like the Peace Officer Bill of Rights to make sure that the deputies and staff get due process, just like any citizen does. And then we have to put in safeguards to make sure that both sides are playing fair and we're actually trying to change things correctly. The first thing I do, though, is I would hire the right command staff. I'll give you an example. In the jail, so many issues with the Hernandez lawsuit, and it's almost a decade later, and there's still troubles and problems. I would do a national search for an honest, ethical, the most qualified jail chief. And I would bring them in, not one of my friends, not somebody I've worked with, not anybody I know, but the best, most ethical, honest, and capable person to take over that extremely important position that's the majority of the sheriff's office budget. Number two, a training program. You're either ethical or you're not, yeah, a little bit, but everything needs practice. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you a quick example. You told your spouse that you love them when you married them, but sometimes you yell at them. Uh, so maybe you go to counseling, right? Maybe you take her out on a date or come out on a date. You have to practice ethics. You have to train ethics. It's something that you exercise. So I would put in our training program, the leadership and ethics training program, at all levels of the organization, not only for now, but for future generations of leaders at the Sheriff's Office. Thank you. We're moving on to question number six, and candidate Nancy, um, the question is, what is your position on goals and allowing immigration and custom enforcement ICE? access to the county jail to detain undocumented immigrants. So this is a question we actually get asked uh, quite a bit, but um, what I'd like to tell the audience and the public, there's already, already lots of questions over the last year as far as how the Sheriff's Department deals with working with Homeland Security, ISIS under Homeland Security, um, about releases. And those laws were put into place because there were a lot of Sheriff's Department that were releasing directly to them. And what that created was, it gets back to what I talked about in the beginning, it created distrust with their communities. You know, the job of a sheriff, running the jail, taking care of the unincorporated areas, has to do with making communities safer. That includes the incarcerated population, that's a community. That includes Castroville, Greendale, uh, that includes working with the cities. It gets down to making communities safer. That's always been my mantra. My vision for myself is making communities safer. How we do that, that's much more complex. But we have to be very careful the things that we do. Because there are people in this country that work really hard, and they, they help our economy. I got asked this question online from somebody, and I, and I told them, look, we have to treat people with respect and dignity. We're not the federal police. Um, we have to enforce, we enforce the Constitution, the state of California, but we also enforce local laws. And if you don't make communities safe, even the community that's not here legally, then they're not going to report stuff. And they're going to be preyed on by other people. They become victims. It's a vicious cycle when you do this. And that doesn't make communities safe. So, you know, my position on that, if they're a violent offender, you know, they're great, robber, I mean, they're violent people, then they should be. They should be. After they serve their time, they should be deported if they, they are not here legally. Because that does make our community safer. But if you get stopped for a broken tail line, you shouldn't you. be deported. Candidate Patterson, same question. As a sheriff, you have to work collaboratively with everybody. 
all the, not only just your, you know, your community, but we have to work collaboratively with our federal agencies, our local agencies, and everyone. We have criminals in our society that that's what they want to do. They want to be criminals and they want to terrorize. They terrorize our communities, they're part of a gang, they're part of whatever it is that makes them feel like they're getting ahead. And we have to figure out a way to focus on that. And working with ICE to selectively look for those criminals that terrorize our community, consistently terrorize our community, is an important part of the Sheriff's Office. Because we can identify where those people are, where these people are terrorizing our community on a regular basis. And of course, most of it has to do with gangs. Also, Jorge Alvarado was just killed recently. I'm sure all of you know that. He was killed by an illegal immigrant that should have been deported. Because why? He terrorized our community. He terrorized it. And we weren't reporting that to ICE. Why are we not doing that? Because the state, because of the, our board supervisors are saying that, hey, we're not going to work with ICE. That's ridiculous. It's our job to be a law and order sheriff that protects the community. And if we go out and we work with ICE collaboratively to identify the ones that are terrorizing our community, the ones that are gang members, the ones that do not they do not want to go into the community and be a productive member of the community, we have to find that person, root out that person, and get them out of our community and get them back to the country wherever they came from. They come from all areas of the country. They're crossing our border every day. Our poor border patrol is inundated with criminals that are terrorists coming across the border. Do the, are there good people that come to our community and work in our fields and work in our stores and work in our uh, restaurants? Absolutely. We don't want to be around them. But we need to go after the ones that are criminalizing and terrorizing our community. And we have to go after them with a vengeance. Because how do we protect our community by not? Thank you. The sheriff and the sheriff's office should not be involved in immigration enforcement. And the reason that is, is because we enforce local laws, we uphold the Constitution of the State of California, and we follow the criminal code. However, it is important to have good relationships with your federal partners like ICE. And I'll tell you why. What the sheriff can do is the sheriff can be committed to aggressively enforcing local law going after repeat violent offenders and gang members who terrorize our communities. That's our role in this. And we should be focusing all our efforts with ICE on those people, but we have nothing to do with their immigration status or if they're deported. We simply arrest them, we hold them in custody, and if there's a warrant for their arrest, we turn them over to whoever has that arrest warrant. Now, what I put in, I, you know, there used to be offices for ICE in, in the sheriff's office. No, we don't need that. The federal government has a lot of money they can get their own offices. But we have to be careful and also conduct training with supervisors in the jail so that they understand the sheriff's policy, his vision, because as the other candidates have said, we have to look at what we're trying to do. We're trying to build safe communities. We want people, regardless of their documentation status, if they're good law-abiding people who are being victimized. We want them to come to the sheriff's office. We want to make sure that if one of their family members gets arrested for a nonviolent misdemeanor offense, that they're going to come home, go back to work, and provide for their children. So it's all about making sure that any cooperation is focused on those violent career criminals. And that's it. Otherwise, we want you to come to us so that we can help you. Thank you. And it poses the same question. Well, state law has really set this standard for us already. Uh, we can't have ICE in our jail. We, can, we don't cooperate with ICE on certain cases, but it's a case-by-case -case basis. So as we've talked about, if it's a serious, violent, repeat offender that's terrorizing, terrorizing our neighborhoods, we should cooperate with ICE at that point. For us to continue to pay for somebody to be incarcerated and go through the court system and, and, and all that, and then release them back into our community that is a violent, repeat offender, I think is doing a disservice to our taxpayers and doing a disservice to our citizens. However, those, those that are working here, that, that are making an honest living, they're working in our hospitality industry, they're working in our ag industry, they're making Monterey County's economy function. We have to also look at that people do make mistakes. And just because we made a small mistake 
and you're willing to pay your price to society, does not mean you need to be deported to another country. Let's go ahead and, and, and support those people, make them continue to help them be productive members of our community, make sure that our economy stays strong, and we have to follow the state law. A lot of obeying the state law that is already in place is the job of the sheriff. We work as the executive part of the, the branch of the government. And that's following the laws that the legislature has passed and is up by the, the judiciary branch. And that's, that's how I, I look at it. We need to cooperate with all of our federal, state, and our local government agencies, as I talked about earlier. And that falls right in line with that. Thank you. We will now move on to question number seven. Uh, start with uh, candidate Patterson. The question is, illegal dumping, vehicle abandonment, and enforcement of the noise ordinance are concerns for unincorporated parts of our county. How do we address these issues? Those are severe issues because I deal with them on a daily basis out of control. They're issues that we have many of them handle because we do not have enough deputies on the streets. When we're not busy, we can respond to these, and I've cited many people for loud music. I've located people that have done trash, and I actually have a unique way of how I've dealt with people that have done trash. If we can find out where it came from, we go to the house, knock on the door, hey, we can cite you, pay that thousand dollar fine, or we can make a deal with you. And I've done this several times where I've had the guy that did that go back out to the community where he dumped the trash, picked up his trash, but you know what, he owes me four loads. And I want a receipt from that. And when I get a receipt that you picked up trash and you did a service to the community that you just dumped it, then we will make sure you don't get a citation. And thankfully, every one of them's done. It's a little bit unorthodox, but it gets somebody thinking. And I guarantee you, I have not run, come across another person that's done that, the same person again. But the other issue that we have is loud music. I'm affected by it. I'm a Crimdale resident. I know a lot of you are affected by it. People are boosting their, their speakers and having bands and all this stuff and they're shaking windows and all. We need to be proper enforcement and citing them consistently. I know the Board of Supervisors just recently changed the citation amount of how much it costs. It's now a $1,000 fine when you get cited for your loud music. You're disturbing the peace of another. We're supposed to have to deal with live peaceful lives. Unfortunately, we have a lot of people that are starting to, like I said, doing these bands and all that. Whatever happened to a nice little room box? it up to where it doesn't disturb the peace of another. I don't know. That's my that's my mentality. That's how I have a party in my house. I don't want to disturb the, the neighbors. But if I have a big party, I tend to invite the neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's where it comes back to community policing and getting involved more in community and going to these because there's houses that are rented out just for you. Thank you. Next is kind of the point, same question. Hi. Uh, Quality of life issues are the majority of the calls that your officers and your deputies go to every day. If we talk about immigration, we talk about family gang members. And yes, and we focus a lot on that. But thankfully, Monterey County is relatively safe. But these quality of life issues can eat at you day in and day out. So I don't think you should have excuses. I think you should come up with plans. Illegal dumping. I'll tell you what we do in the city of Delray Oaks. We have a large area of the old Fort Ord. We get illegal dumping out there all the time. We just don't come and take a report. We do creative things. We set up game cameras. If we get a location that gets several different illegal dumpings, we set up game, uh, game cameras. And that was just a creative solution. We sat around, what are our resources? We don't have a lot, but we came up with solutions. When it comes to things like loud noise and parties, if you don't have a deputy who can get there, do you have a deputy who can call a person who's making the complaint and say, can you get some cell phone video of that? Can you stand out there and get some evidence for me? Then I'll come out there and talk to you about getting a report and working together to cite the homeowner or the person who's playing the party. Just because you can't take care of it right away doesn't mean that you shouldn't work on taking care of the problem. Third is quality of life issues need to be discussed with the community, and that's part of the community policing. This is where community policing really ties into things. It's solving those quality of life issues, it's doing it creatively, and it's building a culture within your agency and with your deputies that when the sheriff takes it seriously, and his command staff takes it seriously, and they take it seriously. Now, I hope nobody here is ever a victim of violent crime again. 
but I guarantee that most of us probably have some of those quality of life issues affect us. It has to be a priority in the sheriff's office. Thank you. Candidate Moses, same question. Well, as, as you mentioned, it's uh, very important to deal with these uh, this, with these issues, quality of life issues, because it is quality of life. And when we talk about safety and security, it does also, it's also the quality of life that you have. I believe in that collaboration. When I talk about collaboration, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Getting the community involved, getting our other government agencies involved to help the sheriff's office solve some of these problems. When we start talking about it, and I've discussed this at length with Supervisor Phillips, when we have the, the noise ordinance issues that are, that are going on, we have these loud parties that we're going to constantly over and over. We need to take more effect, we, we, we need to be more effective in how we deal with that. So when you look at uh, the Board of Supervisors raising that tap, the, the uh, citation fine, that's a huge step, because if it's only $150, they're still gonna have that party next weekend. And what I also advocate for is using such as the uh, code enforcement. Why can't code enforcement be out there on a weekend listening and finding out, maybe using some technology, whether it be a drones or cameras or whatever it might be, and getting out there and doing that and finding those first-time offenders and putting a stop to it then before it becomes this big problem. If it starts to become a problem and it's a repeat offender, repeat offender, now the sheriff's office should start getting involved and be part, more part of that enforcement part of it. But let's start at a smaller level. Let's start and get everybody involved instead of just, hey, the sheriff's office, this is a problem we need to we need, we need you to address it. We'll address it, but we also need help to deal with it. So that collaboration is what I think is key in addressing these, these issues. Thank you. Candidate Nicholas, same question. So if you go to my website, you know, for it's actually part of my plan. I talk about quality of life issues. And you know, when I was putting that website together, they were like, well, that's not sexy enough. And I said, you know, I've been a law enforcement uh, leader for 15 years, and trust me, the community cares about quality of life when we're looking at policing. You know, luckily most people aren't victims of violent crime, and we'll throw everything at it to put those people behind bars when somebody does become a victim of quality of life. But most of our communities deal with the loud parties, the noise, the illegal dumping, the abandoned vehicles. And so you have to have plans for that. I actually sat down uh, with the sheriff when I decided to run, and I was asking about those questions, because they're important to me because I know they're important to the community. And it's like, well, we don't have enough people and blah, blah, blah. But you have to have a plan. You gotta start somewhere. And that's what the, I, I said, you have to start somewhere. You have to, you, you have to start measuring. You have to start figuring this out. I too talked to some of the board of supervisors about these issues. And I talked about you know, the administrative sites, because that's pretty standard in some cities. My last command was an area that was very similar to the hill, to the Prindale area, the canyons, the parties. And if you, you say, well, we're just going to have code enforcement do it, I'm going to tell you right now, it's probably not the best plan, because the parties happen on the weekends. So unless you have the code enforcement working on the weekends at night, they don't call at 10 o'clock at night. They're calling at 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning, when the party isn't shutting down. And then, you know, if we have recruitment and retention issues because they're unhappy with the leadership, then you're not going to have the deputies out patrolling. They're going to be dealing with probably what they call bigger issues, those emergency calls. So you have to have a plan, you have to start measuring it. Because these party houses, because I, I know because I dealt with them, it's not a one-time deal. It's not a two-time deal. It's a repeat deal. And there are other strategies that other places have dealt with. And it surprised me that our county hasn't looked at these other places for best practices, because they actually work. They Thank work. You. <laughs> we are now moving on to question number eight, and the question will begin with candidate Holm. The question is, Monterey County is facing a growing budget deficit of $18.2 million in fiscal year 22-23, $26.4 million in fiscal year 24-25, and includes the Monterey County Sheriff's Department facing a $2.2 million deficit at the end of this year. What would your, excuse me, what would your budget priorities be? And how would you communicate and work with the Board of Supervisors to support your budget priorities? This is the business-oriented approach that I talked about earlier and what I brought to the police departments where I've, I've been the chief. You can't just print money and make money and, and send it out to your different departments. 
So it's going to have to be a collaborative effort, not just with the board of supervisors and developing the budget. You're going to have to collaborate with your other department heads. Because as a city manager, there are several different departments in several different areas, much like the county with several different departments in several different areas that your resources have to be spread to. So as I've said before, one of the things that I would do in my strategic plan for the sheriff's office is a line item by line item review of the budget. $130 million plus. Are you getting the value from that you think you deserve? Most people I talk to across the county say, no. So what are we spending money on that we don't need to be spending money on? With a $130 million budget, you can't tell me that there's something that can be cut so that those resources can go out into the community for more patrol deputies, for more jail deputies. Let's only focus on priorities and basics. The other part of that is horse trading with your other department heads and working on budget strategies. Budgets are cyclical. Sometimes every couple of years and different departments need different money at different points in time over, say, a four or eight year period. You need to be able to work with the other departments and say, listen, I'm willing to give this up out of my budget now and next year, but two years from now, if everything's going fine, we want some help so that we can focus on some of our priorities. I won't ask for one dollar more from the board of supervisors until my staff has gone through that budget, almost like a forensic accounting, cutting out the fat and only focusing on service to the community that make it safer. Thank you. So 85% of the sheriff's budget is uh, uh, salary and benefits for our employees. We can't change that. 85% is locked up. We're not going to change it. The other 15% we have to use to put paper in the printers to make sure the lights stay on. So we don't have a lot of wiggle room with, the, with our budget. But what I do bring to the sheriff's office is looking at alternative funding sources outside of our general fund budget. So when I was the commander in charge of our aero squadron, we identified a need to have it for an airplane, a law enforcement airplane. We were using our, our, um, our team's uh, citizens' airplanes, private airplanes, uh, to fly, and they were doing a great thing and, and, and helping us out. But we needed a law enforcement uh, airplane with the technology that we needed. So I went to that group and I said, we need to, let's identify how we can do this, because I knew we weren't going to get out of our budget, our, our general budget. So we were able to find an airplane. Uh, some from San Mateo County. I got Monterey Peninsula Foundation to purchase that airplane and donate it to the sheriff's office. I then reached out and found out that Naval Coast Graduate School had a camera, a high resolution camera that they were using for experiment, experiments. And they were done with that experimentation and they were just going to get rid of the airplane. So they donated or get rid of that camera. So they donated that camera to the sheriff's office. We also need a law enforcement airplane to be able to talk to the, to the people on the ground. So. I went to Homeland Security and I got grant funding to get that radio installed in the airplane. So we had a fully functional airplane without taking a single dollar out of our, our general fund. And it's still flying today. So looking outside of our general fund is what really needs to happen. I, I can talk about a lot of other programs, but I'll stick to that one since I have two minutes. But there's a lot of other places that we can find money, find funding, instead of always going to the general fund and always going to the Board of Supervisors for that funding. Thank you. So I used to be a certified fraud examiner and a certified fraud specialist. And so I had to understand budgeting. I had to deal with budgets, large budgets. I had to deal with I deal with small budgets. I too, like one of my opponents, would look at the budget line by line. But unlike another one of my opponents, the personnel issues can be affected. Because when you're paying overtime, when you're paying one person, you know, half a million dollars, 400 and something, this is back in 2018, and any of you guys can run the numbers. You can go to transparentcalifornia.com, or you can go to the state controller, and you can see what some of the people are, are making in the sheriff's department. I'm not mad at them. They're taking advantage of the system that's not watching. Right? They're like, this, I can do this because the leadership is not paying attention. And I, I say this because... The large budgets that I used to run, we would look at personnel, we'd look at it over time, because some of the set costs when you're looking at personnel can't be changed. Those are set for benefits, and that's what they get paid, and that's based on whatever their hours. But you can affect the overtime issues. You can start looking at that. How can we do better in that area and save money? You can look at the overtime for courts. 
What's our deal with the courts so we can save on the officers not putting for that all on call time? So with large agencies, yeah, you absolutely can affect some of those numbers. Um, I too would look at my return on investment. What's working for our communities? What's working for our jails? Um, you know, how can we do things better? At least I know probably at least three of the opponents here do grant funding. That's what leaders do in law, law enforcement. We look for grant funding. I got three grants out of the last three grants that I applied for to help bring equipment to my current agency, a smaller agency. Because that's what leadership does. That's what you should expect your leadership to do to help balance the budget when there are ways that, that you know, based on the board of supervisors, you, you can't do that. But the biggest thing is that when you need money, you go to the board of supervisors and you explain the why. Candidate Patterson, same question. I've taken several classes in budgeting and learned how to do line by line. There are agencies that we can seek out, write grants for, to gain more money for certain programs. And those that type of money has to be allocated for that program, not other programs. That's part of the problem with the Sheriff's Office today. Some of that money that's been allocated for those programs is being mismanaged. That's why we need to go line by line by line by line. I can tell you right now, a lot of you will be very upset that I have talked to Dodge. I've talked to we have Dodge Chargers that run up and down your streets here in Castro. That we you pay for as a county. We pay for that. And Dodge has said, hey, we'll provide a free maintenance program because you buy so many of them. But what does our county do? And I can tell you the current sheriff and past sheriffs have gone to the county board of supervisors and said, hey, uh, spend a lot of money on the maintenance of these vehicles. A lot. Enough to probably fund ten deputies. That's about how many, how much we're spending. Why are we not taking it to Dodge? Board of Supervisors turned around and balked at the, the sheriff each time they've gone in and said we need to stop that. And they said, oh, we can't do that. We have the county yard that needs to keep running. We need to keep spending that money and providing for those employees. The sheriff's department is in the business of protecting and serving. They need to go up and stand in front of the board of supervisors and take the good people here behind them because I'm sure now that you guys all know how much we're spending for maintenance program a vehicle. You should stand up right behind me and go, enough. We're sorry. We understand that you have some employees. Dodge will hire a couple of them right now once we start taking and having the maintenance of that vehicle taken care of. That's just one issue of the many overtime. Tina said, overtime is through the roof with certain individuals. You can go to transparentcalifornia.com and you can pull up the deputies that work for you and find out and ask your question, why are they making half a million dollars? Why? Why are the supervisors not finding out right. is this needed? Thank you. We're now at the last Q&A question, number nine, and we're going to start with uh, candidate Moses. The question is, North Monterey County Lula, along with other civil rights groups, has worked for years to try to build positive relations with the Sheriff's Department and address discriminatory practices such as racial profiling, excessive force, pretext stops, and using Castroville as a training ground for deputies. We have made some progress along these lines. What would you do to ensure that we continue to make progress in these areas? I, I appreciate you acknowledging that we have made progress in this area because I, I do believe we are making true progress in, in this area, um, not just here in Cashville but throughout our county. What it really comes down to is education and experience. That experiential training that we're going to be giving our that we do give our deputies and we can continue to give our deputies. We have a CIT program that every deputy, every deputy has to go through. We have implicit bias training that every deputy has to go through. Educating our deputies, having them go through that, experience things from a different lens, from a different, different way. When we do our training, our CIT training, we bring role players in, and we have them role play, um, you know, somebody out on the street, and have the deputies interact with them, and then we critique how that interaction went. What that does is now that deputy has that new experience. He can see that when he goes to that actual call for service, he has this experience he can draw, draw upon. Same way we do when we do firearms training. We make sure that, that it's you know, repetitive so that whenever you get into that crisis moment, you know exactly what to do. It's the same thing with implicit biases when we're talking about uh, how we interact with our communities. 
So continuing that, I'm a member of the uh, police, uh, police Executive Research Forum, which is an international group of chiefs of police and sheriffs that look at these, these different things and what's the best practice in the industry for training. And I will keep up on that, and I do now. We're bringing that into the sheriff's office so that we're using the top level training and what is the most, what's the most effective out there because it's constantly training, uh, changing, and we have to continually continue to evolve and address those issues. And again, getting out of our community, getting out to these groups, making sure that we are interacting with our community in a very positive way. I also will say, if I have a couple seconds, is I want to keep that school resource officer and deputy position open because that's where I make it. Thank you. Candidate Nieto, same question. So law enforcement leaders are part of PERF and we get best practices. I'm a member of that too. I'm a member of the IACP. I'm a member of the Monterey County, I'm president of the Monterey County Peace Officer Association. We join these things. That's what our position does, so, so we end up joining these things. But here's where I'm a little bit different than the other counties. I actually sit on some of those committees that look at racial profiling, that look at vice policing. How do you create community policing and communities that don't trust you? It's great that they make in some inroads with Castroville, but it's very sad when I hear, and I've heard this from the community, that Castroville is a training ground. That's what they felt like. Every else, er, everywhere else in the unincorporated areas, they wanted more police. What I heard from Castroville is like, we want less police, or we want the police to treat us with dignity and respect, and not just run out my 13-year-old who's coming back from the pizza parlor after a football game. And I'm not mad at the cops. I'm not mad at the cops, because that shows me a culture, a culture that's dysfunctional with our sheriff's office. And culture starts with the top. I can get, if I'm a horrible leader, I can send my people that work for me to a million trains, and nothing's gonna change with our communities. Because it needs to start with the leadership. It needs to start with the executive teams who believe in community policing, that take community policing to heart, that sit on these things, that have those conversations. Again, take a look at who I am, Tina Nieto. Take a look at the things that I've done. I'm not gonna wait till I'm the sheriff to do these things. I've been doing them for decades because that's how we create safer communities. That's how we build trust. That's how we create amazing programs. And you know what? When the deputies and the professional staff know that their leaders care about the community and care about them, they start caring more. Thank you. Candidate Patterson, same question. In my 22 years with Monterey County Sheriff's Department, I have seen it evolve. As she said, we've gotten better. We've gotten better because we reach out to our community. But we need to do more. We can always be better. We're never going to be perfect, but we can always be better. One of the things that I've started to notice is some of the community leaders are starting to ask, can I do a right away? Can I see what's going on in the department? That's the one thing about, I can tell you, Monterey County Sheriff's Department, they usually don't tell you no unless you have a felony background or a felony record or something like that, you're on parole or probation. That's how we start to fix our community. When we're able to educate you, and you're able to educate us. I learned as a young boy, my dad taught me very, very young, when I walk through the door, understand that there's somebody in that room smarter than me. They're always us. Gain their trust, gain their wisdom, and learn to be a better person. That's the training that we need to teach our deputies, to be better people. Just like we expect the, the, our community to be better people, we all have to interact and get along together. We can be a better community if we work directly with the community. Not sit in that office, like I said. We have a sheriff right now. He's a figure. He sits in the office. He doesn't come out in your community and ask what the problems are or continue to fix the problem. You know, he's not running fortunate for us. But we have to have a sheriff that's willing to get out hand in hand with our community and say, what's the issue at hand that you're having? Do you feel that we're racially profiling and why? And then that's why we'll take them on that ride along and show them, this is how we're doing the, our policing. Do you understand that? Or do you have a question? And we can sit there and work that out together to fix it and make it even better than it already is today. We're making strides. Sheriff's Department, police departments, they're, they're making strides all over the, you know, the United States and being better. 
95% or more of your tops are great people. There are a few that aren't. We have to weed those people out of the sheriff's office. Thank you. And candidate morning to any questions. I agree with Tina, culture starts at the top. Uh, ethical, transparent, somebody's going to set a vision, set some core values, and part of those core values is the accountability. Right? Accountability at every level of the organization in our interaction with our community is, is probably the most important. So yes, culture starts at the top, but it has the greatest impact at the bottom. So we have to focus our community's relationship with our patrol deputies and our patrol supervisors and our sheriff's deputies who are working in the corrections division because they're the ones that have the greatest impact. So you set the example, but you give the most resources to your line level employees, to your professional staff. Who do I mean by that? I'm going to go back to training. It's, it's one thing to once a year or once every couple of years have implicit bias training. It's another thing to set a program to where all of your supervisors have to read books like Emotional Intelligence. And they're held by their commanders accountable for reading that book and learning what they got on it. And it's teaching classes in Emotional Intelligence to your line level deputies. Not looking just at post and standard best practices, but coming up with creative solutions to make ourselves better people, whether you're the sheriff or a deputy. Another additional thing is we've talked about is having a command staff liaison with each and every community because part of what you want to hear is how are our deputies treating you. So it starts at the top, you set a vision, you put training in place at the lowest level, you invest in your deputies who are going to be out in the community making the greatest impact on that relationship. Thank you. That concludes our Q&A session. And so now we're at the candidate's closing statement with two minutes for each of you. And this time we will start with candidate Nieto. <coughs> Again, I want to thank Blue Life and the community for coming out. But remind me that I am a trusted police chief with 33 years experience. I was endorsed by your deputies because all those things, the, other, the great things the other candidates talked about, I do that on a day-to-day -day basis. My own agency, Marina, went through a transformational change program where we read the books. We took a deep dive. It's a living document. We've been working on it for the last three years. It's not something that happens overnight. It's something that the leadership, you know, make sure you help hold your supervisors to that behavior and then hold their line deputy or their line personnel to that behavior. Morale's up in Marina. I'm one of the only agencies that's completely staffed with a line of officers wanting to come work for Marina because they know we have good relationships with the community, that we do the right thing when it's hard. And deputies want that. The deputies and professional staff want that. That's why the DSA endorsed me. That's why Corac endorsed me. My own officers endorsed me. They said, we're, we're going to be sorry to see you go, Chief, but we know that you can make a difference with the deputies, with the Sheriff's Department. And we all love law enforcement. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't love law enforcement. I've had a lot of feathers in my cap and done a lot of things. And I can retire. And I don't need the money. But you know what? I care. I care about the deputies, I care about the professional staff, I care about communities, and I'm tired, I'm tired of watching everything that's going on in our county. You folks deserve more. That's why I'm ready. Please go to tinanietoforsheriff.com if you want to learn more about me, or just call me. I'll sit down and have a cup of coffee with you, make time and we can chat. I'm going to make you buy the coffee though, that's what I'm going to tell you. So, Tina Nieto for Sheriff, thank you. Thank you. Candidate Patterson. My entire, entire law enforcement career has been with Monterey County Sheriff's Office. I know the ins and outs of Monterey County Sheriff's Department. And I know most of your deputies, and most of your commanders, most of your sheriff, uh, sergeants. And I'm familiar with all of them. There's several different unions, unfortunately, in our Sheriff's Department right now. There's a DSA union for the jail, and there's a patrol union on patrol, and there's a commander union. These people trust me and they know me. They know that I'm going to carry out what I say I'm going to do. They know that I can't fix everything. But to the people that I sought out, I went to the people, a lot of people in our community and asked them, who are your trusted people that we've known for some time that were in the sheriff's department already? And that's when I got the answer. Everybody loved Tracy Brown, a guy full of integrity and promise. 
gave them water, an undershirt. They've already been there, they've already proven themselves. That's why they're supporting me, because they want what's best for Monterey County itself. Not just the Sheriff's Department, but for Monterey County, because the people trusted these guys once before. They trust me. We need the new leadership, and these gentlemen are going to help us pick the right leadership for the community. And when I say that, your sheriff needs to be, number one, working for you. That's his job. For the people, by the people. Like I said in the beginning of this, the politicians across the, this nation have forgotten who they work for. They work for you. I work for you now as a deputy. And I've been working for 22 years, and I've worked every area of this county, and I love the people. I thought I was going to come down here and do a year or two and go back up to Sacramento area where I'm from. Fell in love with this. I mean, like the beautiful weather and not 110 degree heat, <laughs> touching the, the concrete and burning myself. But we have a wonderful community here. And I know if I can get out in the community, I can get the community to support us at the Sheriff's Department and get right behind us to make this a much better place to live for all of us. Please go to my website, patterssheriff2022.com. You'll find out all about me. Call me anytime, I'll take that. All right. Thank you. Candidate one. So we've talked about, about a lot of things. Uh, number one, and I bring it back to what I said first, the sheriff's office has lost its focus. It needs to be refocused. That means turning the entire agency around. Culture, how we treat our communities, how we interact with our communities. All the things we've talked about, I've done. I've turned two struggling agencies around. I combine them to make them a larger, more effective, efficient, and professional agency. We talk about the importance of training. I tripled the training budget for that agency so that we could have professional officers out serving in the community. We talk about building relationships with diverse communities. I have hired more minority officers, promoted more minority supervisors in, in my agency than in the department's entire history. We, we, we talk about looking at budgets and making things more economical and so that we can provide better services. I not only ran police department budgets, I've run city budgets. Not only expenditures, but also understanding income and the importance how that impacts your department's budget as a department head. You can look at my resume online, I don't want to make it a commercial. You can see my education, you can see the places that I've worked, the assignments that I've had. But the one thing I'll tell you is, I will do everything that I've told you I'm going to do here today. And I have an eight-year history as the county's second longest serving police chief of doing just that. We have a great relationship with our community. We catch bad guys. We provide superior service to our community in Delray Oaks and at the airport district. And I look forward to building that culture and doing those things for you. because. I love this job, I love this career, and I love a challenge, and right now the Sheriff's Office is a challenge. Go to jeffpoint.com, you can see all about it. Thank you. Thank you, and hand it over. Well, first I'll start off by saying that I'm very proud of the campaign that me and my team have run up to this point, and I refuse to engage in any kind of negative campaign. If you want to know the truth, look at the uh, Look at the uh, research or look at the, the papers that are out there and the lawsuit and you'll get the truth. If you want to reach out to me personally, I will take a phone call. I will take an email, Joe, Moses, Joe at joemosesforsheriff.com and we can talk about that on an individual basis. But really in closing here, it really comes down to who is the best person to run the sheriff's office. It's going to take commitment, and I talk about commitment, having lived in this community for 27 years and will continue to live in this community for probably for the rest of my life and having that vested interest. It also comes down to experience. I've been in the sheriff's office. I've done that. I know what it's going to take to run the sheriff's office. I know what we're going to need to do to make it better. And I know the hurdles that we need to overcome. And I have the capabilities to be able to make those changes that need to be made in the sheriff's office. And it also comes down to that vision, looking at how we can do better. And specifically, we can talk about a lot of different things, a lot of grand ideas, but I only talk about what I can deliver on. So when I'm up here talking to you and I give you ideas and things that we're going to do going into the future, I know we can accomplish it. I'm not going to make promises that we cannot accomplish. So you can visit my website as well at joemosesforsheriff.com. Please feel free to reach out to me with any other questions that you might have. And again, thank you so much for all of you for coming out and listening to us today. I want to 
want to extend um, my gratitude to all four of you for again accepting our invitation to participate today. And so let's give them a round of applause.